right, turn to Hosea chapter 4. I was going to try to do two chapters today, but with all the controversy that we're going to find out today, uh, I'm only going to do one, uh, so chapter 4, so we don't leave here at uh, 10 o'clock. Otherwise, it would have taken longer. Um, let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for your tremendous love and passion for your people. Lord, I can't imagine another book that describes your love and affection, and yet like a passionate husband looking and searching and praying and seeking for his wife. Uh, Lord, there you are, never forsaking your people, never casting them off. Uh, but yet, Lord, you, uh, you brought justice and you brought chastisement and you brought correction to a people that were very hard-hearted and difficult to deal with. Lord, I, um, this message could be very well spoken of the church today. And Lord, um, help us to see some very key and relevant points where we could apply to ourselves, to this church, and to the church at large. We praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you haven't been with us for a while, um, this is our, I think it's our third message on Hosea, third or fourth already. Uh, religion, moral, and politics are the main topics Hosea deals with. It's a tremendous book, but it's a very difficult book to... Um, not only understand, but to teach, because it doesn't read like uh, a doctrinal statement. You, you know, you like Paul's letters are very clean, right? That he begins with a statement, he has his points, and you can actually go point one, point two, point three. This is chapter four, chapter five. It's almost like the book of James. If you ever read the book of James, a study of the book of James, it doesn't read like that either. It reads like one, like, a, like the book of Proverbs or like an Old Testament prophet. It's a series of sermons with no real timeline of when or where he preached. They were just scathing, to some degree, powerful messages to a people that were hard-hearted. But then comes the redemption, comes the promise of hope, comes the, uh, the, 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 the promise that God is going to bring them back. And this is what we've been studying for the past few weeks, is that he touches on the religion of the day, Israel, and its morals, and its politics. And we have to make one adjustment to our thinking whenever we study the prophets. We don't apply it to the nation that we live. We don't apply it to the Trump administration. We don't apply it to the office or the State Department. Why? Because correctly, exegetically, this was for Israel, and Israel was a theocracy. It's the only theocracy that had ever existed. Therefore, king, priest, and prophet were collectively the leadership of Israel. Kings, prophets, priests were all collectively, spiritually united to lead the people of God back to himself and back to the word. We as a church, a New Testament church, does not have a country. It does not have a physical geographical kingdom. It does not have a flag. It does not have a politics. It does not have a president. There's no Christian nation. The kingdom of God is as Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. It's coming, it's here, but it's in the form of the church submitted unto Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It transcends nations. It doesn't matter where you're from. It only matters if you're born again. So therefore, you really doesn't, it doesn't apply to the nation of the United States specifically. Now, there are applications that we can draw on from, uh, to our society, but it first applies to the church. So the things that Hosea speaks about, before we go and, go and uh, label the Democrats or the Republicans like that, first we have to look at the state of the church because the church itself has leadership. The church itself has priests. The church itself has pastors and teachers. And they're the ones that are the focus. If we're going to apply it to the church, they're the ones that we need to focus on first. Before we even apply it to the society, we need to apply it to the state of the church. This is why it's a very convicting book. And when uh, people teach it incorrectly, they immediately go right to society. Easy fruit to pick, right? It's a low-hanging fruit, we would say. It's easy to go after the, the Marxists, the communists, the socialists, the rioters. It's easy to, oh, you see, oh, terrible. And it's true. But first, we must apply it to the state of the church. It's a little harder to swallow, isn't it? And some of the things Hosea says, it's very applicable. We could have, he could have been writing to us today. And one of the things that 
he deals with is the pain of infidelity. And of course, the infidelity here has to do with Israel and God. They were in a marriage relationship. They were in a loving relationship as God calls Israel back or calls God, uh, Israel to himself on Mount Sinai. He married her. It's all through the Old Testament, right? He laments that Israel has turned to other gods because that was God's wife. Yahweh's wife was Israel. And he laments as a brokenhearted husband that his wife has gone away from him. And it's embodied in Hosea. Hosea married a immoral woman. And after having children with her, needless to say, two of them could not have been, could be, not his. Uh, the two are in questions are Lo Rahami and Lo Ami. For sure, Jezreel is his. The other two are questionable. And therefore, through the children, God speaks. Jezreel, God sows. Lo Ami, not my people. Lo Rahama not going to have compassion. But in those children, God speaks a message to Israel saying, because you have been scattered, because you have turned to other gods and have gone away and committed infidelity, like an adulterous affair, but spiritually with other gods, I'm going to scatter you, you're not my people, and I will not have compassion on you. That's a strong message. And so for the children of Hosea would have been standing him as he's preaching this and go, hey, Hosea, aren't those two kids, are they questionably yours? I mean, are you sure they're yours? I mean, your wife's been going into town. And he could say, you know what? Yes, that might be true, but you're not God's people either. It's questionable if you're God's people. Because you've been whoring around with Baal and Ashtoreth and all these bulls and all these uh, cows and all these golden calves. You've been worshiping these gods in the, in the high places and the groves. Therefore, God doesn't know if you're his. Because if you were his, you would act differently. And through the children's example of illegitimacy, God would say to the nation, yeah, you guys are illegitimate too. Remember what John the Baptist said to the first century, Jews of the first century? We are of Abraham's seed, they said. We're Abraham's children. Well, of course we're children of God, said the religious leadership. And John the Baptist said, God can raise up stones for children of Abraham. Don't be so cocky about your relationship to God because you're Abraham's children. God can raise up stones and be Abraham's children. The ax is laid at the root of the tree. It's coming. And boy, did it come during the time of Hosea. The nation itself, the nation of Israel, that generation... Uh, was not forgiven. That generation went into captivity. That generation went and were uh, destroyed by the Assyrian Empire, as we would see. But one of the major problems was failure of leadership. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. The failure of leadership that they should have been telling the Jews, you're married to God. You are the bride of Yahweh. You need to behave in such a way that you are faithful to God like a wife is faithful to her husband. But just like Hosea's wife, Gomer, was not faithful, Israel was not faithful. And therefore, Hosea had a broken heart. And if you ever had, um, um, you know, some of us and some people in our fellowship have suffered the pain of infidelity, but Hosea would have lived through it. Uh, don't ever forget that part, that it is a lesson, but it's a real life lesson. Hosea was a real person with real, a real character, with real issues in terms of his relationship with his wife, not because of him, but because of her, and felt the pain and the suffering of not being loved, and although loving, not being loved back. And that's one of the most painful things to suffer. But now Hosea can say, Lord, I can't stand this pain. And the Lord can say, Hosea, now you know how I feel. Now you have a message. Go and preach it. And that's what he did. And um, so let's read a couple of verses in chapter 4. It says, Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a, my translation says case. It's literally the word controversy. God has a controversy uh, against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness, no kindness, or knowledge of, the, of God in the land. This is an indictment, and it comes out very strong right away. A controversy. What's a controversy? That means God has something against you. And this was said of Israel. But not only of Israel, he's going to go on and explain to Judah. 
And it could apply to any one of us. It could apply to any person, literally, that God has something against us. God has something against you. God has something against me. God had something against me, and I didn't know. But in 1995, I realized that it was true, <laughs> that God had something against me, and that my sins were ever before him. And if I didn't bow and change and repent and turn toward him and forsook my sin, that I would, uh, I would have lived through that. Um, you know, I don't know how long I would have lived after that. I have no idea. But um, I had friends that died. I had friends that uh, didn't know the Lord, and they died. But I don't, and I used to do other things, probably more crazy than they did. God had mercy on me. But it was not without warning. God made it clear that he was God. God made it clear that he was the Lord. And God made it clear that um, his controversy with me is that he demanded faithfulness. He demanded faithfulness. And that's sometimes something we have to understand. God did not ask for faithfulness. He didn't go to Israel and say, would you please believe in me? Please, I know the other things are very, very um, you know, tempting, but you have to make a choice. Now, God demanded faithfulness. Because think about this. Ashtoreth, um, Baal, um, Molech, are they, are they real gods? These are inventions of men, inventions of people's minds. Uh, they see a tree and they call it a god. <coughs> and we'll see that at the end of this chapter. Uh, they don't exist. God's the only one true God. God's the only real God. Therefore, he could say, I demand of you to follow me. I command of you to follow me because there is no other alternative. There is no other way except the ones you made up in your mind. Therefore, you're going to perish. You're going to die. And since God is the king, he can command his people to, come after, to follow him. That's, that's what a king does. He commands and he wants people to follow him. But he won't force it upon them. And this is what we'll see here. He, like a loving husband, would go to them and plead with them and talk to them and lovingly bring them back. But not without its controversy. Not without its warnings. And not without its chastisement. Remember, this generation that did not repent, 722 B.C., Assyria came and judged that nation the nation of Israel, the ten, 10 northern tribes. But let's continue. There is no faithfulness. There is no faithfulness. So God has a complaint. There's no faithfulness. The, the word faithfulness, if you have a different Bible, a different translation, I should say, it's the word for truth. There is no truth. One way of saying it, there is no truth. Now, that is, that is a major, major statement in today's church. There is no truth. God cannot find truth within Israel. The word for truth in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, is a word for reality. Reality. Jesus is the truth. You can loosely translate it. Jesus is the reality. What is the reality of life? What is the reality of your life? What is the reality of my life? Um, for many, many years, it was me and what I thought and what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do my own life until I realized I was living a lie. And the reality is... I needed to live according to God's word, God's reality, because that's the only true reality, because he's the only true God. All other gods are false, including my own gods that I made up for myself. That was, you know, me, myself, and I, triunity. That was the triunity of my life. That was a false, a false God, a false triunity that was to be toppled very, very quickly. But nonetheless, no truth, no reality. You're living a lie, God would say to people. You're living a lie. You can't find truth anymore. He says, no love. The word kindness, the word hesed. Hesed. It's the idea of uh, kindness. It can be translated kindness. It can be translated uh, loyalty. It, it's a wonderful word. We studied that in, in our first lesson here. It's that um, they were not kind, no love, no loyalty. But it's interesting it is relating to not just love for God, but love for each other. And you'll see why in a moment. They were, when God is, when, when a society has a vacuum of spiritual things, so there's no spirituality, there's no truth, there's no reality of God, then it's very, very soon after that is when people are going to begin to treat each other as if there is no God. And you saw that in Israel, 8th century Israel. You see that in 21st century America. Live like there is no God. So eventually you will not have any love for one another 
You won't have any love for the lost. You won't have any love for anyone else, including God. But eventually you will begin to attack each other. And you'll see that why in a moment where God says, blood upon blood, blood touches blood. There's shedding of blood, and then there's more shedding of blood. There was, this is a violent time, but it was a very prosperous time, which is another story for another time. Uh, it was a very prosperous time within Israel, even though it was quite a bit violent. And it says, no knowledge of God. No knowledge of God. Now let's think like a, like a Hebrew. Okay, let's think like a Jewish person. I'm not Jew. My family is married to a Jewish family, so we can think of it in this way. But think of it in a Hebrew mind. The word no. Okay? No, uh, it says, no knowledge of the word of God. I'm oh, sorry, no knowledge of God in the land. What does it mean? Well, <coughs> we have an idea of knowledge, or the word no, uh, that comes from the Greek idea. The Greek idea is uh, book smart. You know something because you read it, or you have been informed, or you agree with the facts, or you assent with the information that you have been given. Now you know, like you know who the first president of the United States was. I hope. Okay. And uh, he crossed the Delaware. Okay. And um, first president, you know, but you have no yada. It's the word, my little Jewish friend, uh, your little Jewish friend, yada. You have no yada of George Washington. Um, the word da'at Elohim, the knowledge of God. What does that mean? The word no, ya'ad, means all this. <laughs> uh, in order for us to know the word, we have to know what it means as a Jew. When they would hear the word no, they would think of, Oh, a husband and a wife coming together. Adam knew Eve. He knew his wife, and she conceived and had children, right? That, that was the idea of knowing. You knew somebody. You didn't know about them. <laughs> you knew them. You were in union with them in a real close, I mean, anyone closer than that. I mean, that's as close as you can get, right? It was a, it was a union. It was a mental thing as well, all right? So think of your marriage, right? It's not just a mental thing. I know she's my wife. I know. But I also know she's my wife. We've had five kids together, right? So I know, as well as you, you know your wife in a mental activity. You know her, too, in a union. But it's also a spiritual activity, too. Now think of God in that way. You know God because you've known about him, but you also know God in an intimate way because you are committed in a faithful relationship with him. That's knowing God, which it doesn't just mean here. It means activity. It means doing. It means action. So now this word is in the background to the word faith in the New Testament as well. Remember James? Without action, activity, your faith is dead, right? That's the background to James. So we have to know this in order to get to James. Otherwise, we get confused and we think he's talking about, you know, the, the works of the law, which he's not referring to the works of the law. He's talking about action, the word erge, right? Energy. You need to have energy to your faith. You need to have activity to your faith because you know God, right? So... We used to have bifocals, now it's trifocals, right? Trifocals. Anyone here have trifocals? All right, very good. I knew somebody did. <laughs> uh, the bifocal ones, we're going to leave those aside because to know God, we need three things. We need to know him. I can read my Bible today and know more about God today. But I could also relate to God. I could know what he's saying, I could relate to what he's saying, but if I don't do what he says, I don't know him. You see the point? I, I could check my boxes. I know about God. I read it today. You know, pastor went 10 minutes over. I know. I heard it today. Uh, I could relate to what he said. There's some things that he might have said are true. I don't buy everything, but, you know, some, I could relate to it. But... 
I have to go home and do it now. And then I could say, I know God. You see it? You see how it works? Like faith, right? You have to exercise your faith. You have to know God. And so uh, let's put it another way. Uh, I have to know God in my mind. I have to love God with all my mind, I'm told in the scriptures. I have, I'm in a covenant relationship with God, but I am a committed relationship to God. That means I'm faithfully committed to him, walking like in, a, like in a marriage, right? You can take that into your marriage relationship as well. You don't just tell your wife, I know you're my wife, that's it. I just know, you know, and you know, and I know, and that's all we need to know. But if there's no love, passion, romance, activity, right? You know, holding her hand, walking on the beach, or, you know, in the case of, you know, in the, I, I told Sergius, you know, it's just, you should go and, you know, horseback riding, and, you know, that's, you know, without your shirt, and then just go on the beach, and, and then she'll really love you. That's, that's really passion and love, right? That's, uh, that's every woman's dream. Oh, she's back there, too. Oh, all right, good. Rebecca's every, every, every wife's dream, right, is for her husband to come pick her up on the beach on a horse without his shirt on, right, and uh, ride happily ever. I think I saw a commercial. But anyway, what's that? Oh, okay, sorry. Gave you some bad thoughts. Okay, um, covenant, cognitive, commitment, because there is no division between the mind and the heart. We're still talking about the word no by the way. Don't lose sight of that. There is no division between the heart and the mind. That means what you know in your mind is what you express in your heart. So it's never a, this, this sort of intellectual relationship with God because you've read a lot of books. It's an intimate knowledge of God that because maybe the books, but for sure the Bible, it has drawn, it's drawn you so close to God that you are intimately uh, involved in activities that glorify him because he's leading you. And as a New Testament believer, we have the Holy Spirit who empowers and leads and, fo and we follow him as we're guided by the Holy Spirit. We have this intimate knowledge of God that it's almost impossible to explain to somebody that doesn't know. Like, how do you know God exists? And this is about as simple as I can make it. I talked to him this morning. I know that doesn't, I mean, it's not like this, whoa, amazing intellectual thing that you just brought up, but it was a, a reality of life. I was sharing with a, a young lady from my, uh, um, I was on vacation, shared with this young lady with my wife, and uh, we're both sharing with her. And said, How do you know God exists? I just talked to him today. I just prayed and I just talked to him. I know he's real. And, and, and I, like I said, it doesn't, you know, tickles your, your brain activity. It's like, oh, that's so silly. But it isn't, isn't it true that, I mean, you can basically boil it down to you know God because you know him, because you're in, in an intimate, loving relationship with him that is both intellectual and emotional. And what I mean by that is you don't have to, you just don't have to sacrifice the idea of just you know God by, you know, I know him because I know my statements of faith. You know, here's the bulletin. I had a bulletin up here. Here's the bulletin. We know what we believe, right? I know God because my statements of faith says it. <laughs> it's right here. But we know God because we love God. And we are intimately involved in his activities as he's leading us and guiding us. And so you have this idea of theology and doxology. Theology is what you know and know about God, or theology, study about God, and doxology, the worship of God or the intimacy with God. Knowledge that leads to activity. Turn to Hosea 6. Uh, is it verse 6? Yes, verse 6. <coughs> and look at this, what he says. 6, 6. Don't add an extra 6 to that, but just 6, 6. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. The word is, it could be translated steadfast love. And in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now think about this. Remember, think about like, like a Jew. And this is very helpful when you study the prophets. They have this, uh, I guess you could call it chiasmic type of writing, where the first line of one verse relates to the first line of the next verse or the next phrase, Okay. For I desire loyalty or steadfast love and not sacrifice. That's one statement. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. 
Chiasmic relationship. What is related to each other? It's in red. What is related to each other? Love and the knowledge of God. That's what, it's, that's what the prophet is trying to say. This is what God delights. He desires steadfast love and that sacrifice. The knowledge of God is connected to love. Love and the knowledge of God go together. You don't have to sacrifice one or the other. That's the amazing thing. It's passion and knowledge. And unfortunately, we've made it sort of like um, um, or, like either or. And we can have both. And that's what the word no is in the Hebrew. So all that to say, that's verse two, uh, verse one. Uh, knowledge of God. No, I know God. And in some religious circles, some Christian churches, you, you know, it's, it's all about the knowledge. It's all about knowledge, and you've got to get it, and you've got to get it in here. And uh, there's no passion. There's no love, no activity, no, uh, you know, there's this resolve for God. There's nothing. It's just intellectual. It's just, you know, I know, I know my statements of faith. I know my five points of doctrine. I know my seven points of this. I just know. I know. I know. And in some places, it's exuberance, passion, love, like jumping up and down, and it's, it's, but they don't know anything, right? And it's just as bad because there's no love, there's no knowledge, and there's no love, and there's no passion, no activity, and yet you don't know what you're doing, because, but you're really active. And the Bible says you don't have to have either or. You could actually have both. And it's it's. Necessary to have both, because that's the word no. That was just verse one, so go back to it. Um, right now, this is why I get in trouble. Um, here's another verse. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, right? Because they've forgotten the law of your God. They forgot the law of God. Now, let's look at verse two. A list of crimes, a list of sins, you could say. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, adultery, they employ, they employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. The idea here are the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Um, commandment 3, 9, 6, 8, and 7 are all there. Uh, the first one, <coughs> excuse me, the first one, uh, the, the, the idea of swearing, it's the idea of using God's name in vain and using God's name uh, to a point where you can curse somebody by taking God's name into your conversation with them. And this was done very, very, very much in the, in the ancient Middle East, where you would use a, the name of your God to bring a curse upon someone. And uh, you can swear by God that this is going to happen. You can swear by God that you're going to bring a curse into, into someone's life, or you can use the God, God's name in a profane way. That's what it means by swearing. And what they're saying is that you, you, they're swearing up and down in this, in this land. There's all these swearing, and it's not nothing to do with God. It's actually they're taking God's name in vain. They're stealing. They're committing adultery. There's deception. There's murder. There's violence. So much violence that it's bloodshed upon bloodshed, literally one blood leading to another blood. It's like one person gets killed, and then another person gets killed and lands right next to him in the pool of blood. Therefore, the land mourns. And everyone who lives in it languishes. And along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and, the de and, the, and also the fish of the sea, they disappear. Now, this is very much dealing with the, how would I put it, the repercussions of sin in the nation of Israel. Remember, Israel is it's, it's quite unique. It's, you read Deuteronomy, just as an example. And Deuteronomy makes it very, very clear. The land of Israel is so unique. There's such a unique relationship with God that rainy seasons and weather are related to the relationship with God and uh, Israel and God. God says, if you don't turn from your sins, the skies will look like bronze and you're going to get no rain. It got so bad. It was so bad at the time of the kings. Remember the story of Elijah? Three and a half years, no rain. Right? Just God just wanted to mess with their weather? No, it just it was because of the result of their sin. Their sin caused no rain. God promised the early rain and the latter rain all the time. Read Deuteronomy. But if you sin, he says, if you sin, I will shut the, the, the skies from you. I will shut the I will shut the heavens from you. So this is an example here. It was so bad, the whole, whole nature itself was suffering. 
the animals, right? It's not just the rain for the people, but it's the animals. It's the, it's the condition of the land, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the, uh, the, fish of the sea. I almost said the fish of the sky. But the fish of the sea, they will disappear. Why? Because of the sin of the people. Remember, there is no such thing as a private sin. There is no such thing as my own little, nobody knows, sin. God will call you out. God will expose it, the Bible says. Jesus even said that, right? Your sin will find you out. Now, in Israel, it was quite clear. I mean, think about this. It's such a unique relationship that you know when you're in a bad relationship with God. You know, it's not like here where drought comes, we blame it on, you know, global global warming. We're just talking about that. Uh, and, and you bring a glacier in, and you melt it down, and you get the water, and you siphon it, and you put it through. It's not like that in ancient Israel. To get water, you had to repent. To get water, you had to get right with God. Wouldn't be, wouldn't your life would be a lot easier if that were to happen like that, right? <laughs> like all of us would be in right relationship with God, right? It means no rain. You get no water in your faucet. You can't take a bath unless you're right with God. I mean, that was the, a, a, a measure, a barometer of their faithfulness to God. It was really interesting, quite unique. No other nation is like that. So we can't apply it to the states. And somebody goes, oh, California, there's no rain for the last seven years. How many inches do we have now? 21, 22, <laughs> 33. Oh, my goodness. yeah. Praise the Lord. But, you know, some people were saying, well, God is, is cursing the nation. I said, well, you're applying it to Israel. I, I, I could surely apply it to where God uh, may withhold some things from individuals. You can't just go absolutely for a fact. Um, Jesus said God makes the sun shine on the just and on the unjust. You know, he makes the rain fall. I mean, it's, um, he could do it, no doubt about that. But this was specifically dealing with Israel. Now, let's go to verse 4, because this is where it gets really interesting. Remember, the failure of the priest. Verse 4. Let no one find fault and let no one offer reproof, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. The failure of the priest. Now, you can mark that down on the side of, you know, in the New Testament, every believer is a priest, but these are leadership. This is the leaders, of, you know, priestly leaders. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, they were the ones who were to instruct the people how to follow God. That was their job. That was their continual job in the temple to really lead the people back to God. They would, some of them offer sacrifices, some of them sang, but they all had to encourage people in the word of God. In fact, there was one king, and I believe it was Hezekiah, who uh, through its own expense, tax exp expenses of his, own, of his own money, of his own treasury, uh, went around with the priest in Judah to different towns and different villages, instructing them to come back to the Word of God. That was one of the revivals in Hezekiah, is to go through town to town and teach people to come back to the Lord. That was in Judah. Now, this is in Israel. But the failure of the priests will be considered today the leaders of the Christian churches today, the pastors, the teachers, the people that God has put in leadership. That would be equivalent to that. Failure of the priest. What was the priest? <laughs> what was their issue? So you'll stumble, he says, by day, and the prophet also will stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. Now, the word destroy there has to do with um, incapacitated, and it's a very strong word, but it's the word incapacitated. She won't be able to help you, and it's relating to Israel, right? Uh, the, the mo their mother was Israel, so the land was like their mother, and they won't, the, Israel will be incapacitated to help you. This is dealing with the priest. What the priests were doing was just as bad as the people. In fact, the reason why the people were idolatrous is because the priests were idolatrous. Now, this is Tel Dan. This is Dan, north of Israel. Think of your map and your map in your head. North of Israel, they have found the high places. Well, this is one of the high places. Most likely, this is the, the, the place where archaeologists are almost 99% sure in accuracy. <coughs> And in agreement, which is hard to do in archaeology, that this was the place where they had the golden calf. Remember Jeroboam had the golden calf, one in the north, Dan, one in the south, Bethel, right? And this is the one in the north. And it fits perfectly the way it's described in the scripture. And the priest would have been worshiping. They would have been worshiping these things. Jeroboam made two golden calves, one in the north, one in the south, and this is what they would have been doing, the priest. 
Now, if you came to church and the pastor here, or the teacher, was um, more immoral than you, how would you feel about that? That's if you think you're immoral, right? But let's just say you were. And he said, well, I'm just going to go to church. I feel bad. And you come, and that guy, he's got, he's a womanizer. He's a violent man. And you're like, um, he's worse than me. I mean, I thought I'd come for some kind of comfort or some kind of a, um, you know, advice, but uh, no thanks. That's would have been, that would have been, the, the people would have been like that. It's like, I'm, I'm, I feel terrible about, you know, killing that guy. Uh, you know, this is not in a joking manner, but that was the violence and the sinful and the adultery. And I've been faithful to my wife. And you come to church and you realize the pastor's been doing that with several people. And you, you just don't know where to turn. And so God says, nobody, let nobody find fault and let no one offer reproof among the people. Look to the priest, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. You will stumble day, and the prophets will also stumble with you by night. The idea is constantly stumble. The priests were constantly heading into the wrong direction, constant. They were more um, lawless than the people. So the people didn't learn anything, and the priests continue to do more and more wickedness. Now, this is, uh, this is like today. This would have been like today, where you, know, you would go to, you know, you, hopefully the pastor's living in a right relationship with God, um, but you turn on TV sometimes and you wonder, some of these guys... I'm like, I wouldn't take advice from, at all from those guys. You know, third marriages, leaving their wives in the middle of the relationship and going after another one, and it's just caught in scandals, and it's just, it would have been the same thing. But God says, uh, you'll stumble. If you follow those guys, you're going to stumble, and, um, and I will incapacitate, I will destroy your mother. Now, look at verse 6. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. We studied that already. <coughs> now think of the word my people would have been lo ami. In this case would have been just ami, my people. Right? So from this verse all the way to I believe it's verse 15, it's all relating to that, that other son that he had, lo ami, my people. You're going to see God calling his people my people. My people are destroyed for the lack, lack of knowledge. Who should have been given them the knowledge? Priest, they had it. Deuteronomy 17 says that they were to instruct the people. They weren't doing it. So they were being destroyed. They didn't know God. No intimately, right? They had, it's not, so let me make it clear. They, they had the, the Torah. They had this, the, the, the scriptures as, as it was written up to, up to this point. It's not that they didn't know. It's just that they didn't know intimately God and how to walk in his ways. But they had it. They just were not instructed to do so. And so uh, Paul tells Timothy to correct, reprove, instruct, rebuke, right? In some places, even with great patience. But that's what the Word of God is for, is to instruct that the men of God will be equipped for every good work. That's what the Word of God was given for. And the priest, they didn't care. They weren't applying it to themselves. They weren't teaching the people. And so it was blind leading the blind, Jesus said. Uh, regarding the people of his days. And because you have rejected knowledge, okay, so when we think of those, remember what we talked about for that long of a time, the word knowledge, it's, it's not just, you just didn't know anything, it's just you didn't intimately know God. I will also reject you from being my priest. Now God's saying, you're not going to, you may have the robe, <laughs> you may have the shirts, you may have the Hawaiian shirts, you may have whatever you have, but you're not mine. Now, somebody can come up here day in and day out and preach and teach at a church, at a pulpit, and if they're not God's, boy, that's a big problem. Right? They may be the church's pastor, but they're not God's pastor. And at that point, exit right. Exit left or exit right, whatever the case may be. Um, I will also reject it from being my priest, since you have forgotten the law of your God. And I will also forget your children. So the idea here is they were supposed to disciple, in a, in a New Testament sense, 
and help people grow like children of the faith. You know, they're helping them grow. And the people were just so lawless, just like the priest, that they didn't know anything, and God rejected them. I will change their glory. Oh, sorry, verse 7. They will be multiplied more. Uh, they, the more they multiply, they sin, the more they sin against me. And I will change their glory into shame if they feed on their sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 2, we see this um, almost drawn out technically, beautifully, even more descriptive. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 2 that the, his people have, something has happened. That, like, unlike anything before, a people changed their gods. This doesn't happen, right? God is lamenting that Israel had a God, which was Yahweh, and he's talking, and he's saying, this is amazing. A people actually changed their God. Not even the pagans do that. The pagans are really faithful to Baal. They're really faithful to Asherah. But here is Israel changing their gods and saying, we're not going to follow God. And it's, it's so weird. It's never happened. And they've actually rejected the fountain of living water. And they've made cisterns, broken cisterns, that have no water. It's like they had this beautiful living water, this beautiful, awesome relationship with God. And they ex exchange it for toilet water. So you have this beautiful wonderful, iced, cooling water, and you said, no, nah, I don't like it. Let's just drink from the toilet. Now, nobody would actually do that cognitively and, you know, in a, in a rational way. However, then people <laughs> in Israel said, yeah, we don't like the living water. We don't like this wonderful, vibrant, passionate relationship that God that loves us. We want a God that's going to be a, a master to us, slave us, make us do all kinds of sinful things. And Jeremiah laments, because that was the attitude of the people. And it said, um, I will change their glory. The more they multiply, the more they sin against me. Now, this is the time of prosperity, Jeroboam II. Time of Jeroboam II, expanded the borders. People had money. Houses was up. Stock market, 20000 Everybody was happy making money. There were more priests. And you would think, well, more priests, more teaching, more priests. More evangelism, right? more pastors, more discipleship, more, uh, uh, more people knowing the Word of God. Instead of one Bible study a week, there's seven Bible studies every day because we have all these other pastors and leaders and teachers that are going to teach the Word of God. And he says, nope, the more they multiplied, the more they sinned. And actually, sin got bigger because there were more of them because nobody knew the Word of God. Nobody knew the knowledge of God. Uh, they, 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 they had the statements of faith, they could read the Torah, but nobody had a heart for God. Remember, passion, love, vibrancy, and intellectual knowledge all goes together. Well, they could read the Torah, but they didn't care, and they, couldn't, they could care less about applying it. And they feed on the sin of my people. And this is interesting because, this is sort of a cartoon, um, the people, now take a look at this in the Old Testament, the priests lived off the sacrifices of the people. That was actually in the book of Deuteronomy. I'm referring to Deuteronomy because Hosea is like intertwined with Deuteronomy. So if, you, if you, some of these things don't make sense, I encourage you, highly encourage you, read Deuteronomy. It's not that long. No, it's not that long, but you can highlight some of these things, especially Deuteronomy 17, uh, Deuteronomy 28. These are specifically dealing with what Israel was going to do. Prophetically, God said they will do this, but if they will repent, I would, I would bring them back. And it lays out the conditions. If you sin, I'm going to chastise you. Anyway, in Deuteronomy, it makes it very clear that all through the law, even Levitical uh, priesthood, that they were going to live off the people's uh, sacrifices. So uh, the priests, all they had to do, and it was engage in the Word of God and live the Word of God and teach people the Word of God. And so they didn't have to go, they didn't have to worry about getting a job. They didn't have to go out there and, and find out how their next meal was going to come. They lived of what the people brought. They, they were, it was God allowed a portion of the sacrifices to be given to the priests. So they, that was their livelihood. They didn't have to go to work. God was providing for them through the sacrifices. Well, there were sin sacrifices and all kinds of sacrifices, right? But the sin sacrifices brought a lot of food. So their incentive was, well, if people sinned, there'll be more money. There'll be more food. So what's the incentive of making the people not sin? Right? It's like the, the racist uh, Rainbow Coalition racket that they have, right? 
Al, Sh Al Sharpton and all these guys, right? They don't want racism to stop. As soon as the, the Rainbow Coalition and there's no racism, there's equality, what there is, unlike any other nation that I know, but they have to trump up the fact that it's not. So, because if there was no racism, according to them, the money would dry up. So they have to keep up this, this narrative that, hey, there's racism, I can't believe the white people are turning into blacks, they don't get hired and all this stuff, because they'll never, ever, it'll never stop, because as soon as it does, they won't have any money. Think of it in the same way. As corrupt and as crooked as that is, the priests here were even more. They actually delighted that the people sinned. Sin some more. I'm not going to tell you to stop because you're bringing some luscious cakes and some luscious food and steaks, and, and they were actually making money. And so people sinned, and they felt terrible, and they came back. Remember, they had no temple because they couldn't go to Jerusalem. They had to go to Dan or Bethel. And this wasn't even a real priesthood. The real priesthood was in Jerusalem, but there was, God was warning them. And the whole, the clergy, you would say, the people, the pastors, um, they looked at this racket as a means to supporting themselves. So what you have all of a sudden is professional priest, which is an oxymoron if there ever was. It's like professional pastors. That would have been the same thing, right? Uh, professional pastor, professional priest, prof you know, I'm a professional. What does that mean? You're after my money? Because that's what it means. Because, uh, you know, it's not a calling. It's like a career. And that's what they were making it, a career. So, you know, people of the collar, this is just a cartoonist joke, right? Uh, they were actually hirelings. Now, we know what Jesus said about hirelings. John chapter 10 this is the hireling sees the wolf. And because he's a hireling, he doesn't care for the sheep. He's only concerned that the check's going to clear the next day. He runs away and he leaves the sheep all for the wolf to destroy and eat up. Right? But the true shepherd, Jesus, speaking of himself, he lays down his life for the sheep. Right? So the emulation of true shepherds is to care to the point that you lay down your life for the sake of the sheep. They're more important than you. That's the sign of a true pastor, is that they're more important than them, right? Whenever you see a pastor that saying that they're more important than the fellowship, leave, get out, right? But if a pastor values the people more than himself, then it's a true shepherd, right? That's the, that's the reality. And they were not doing that. And they were uh, committed to not to teach anything about the the, 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 the sin of the people, they only used it to manipulate the people and gave them a license to sin so that money will continue to come. And this is very interesting because that's what, what was happening. And, um, you know, to the point where they, they had a lot of people and they were all coming. And they're not going to talk about repentance and turning back to God because if we do that, then they won't come. And if they don't come... I won't have any money. And if the churches get small, because I've been saying the right things, and only the true seekers are coming, the true people of God are coming, then that's going to be a very few people. We're not going to have enough money. And so we have to broaden our message to the point where it's palatable to everybody. And yeah, I don't care if they're really sinning. They'll get that straightened out. But we want them to come. Aren't you going to talk about that they shouldn't commit immorality, fornication, adultery, stealing, things like that, repenting? No, that scares people away. And we want the churches to be full. And that's what the priests thought. That's exactly how they thought. It's exactly like what they think today. i got to hurry. So the, the priests were politically and spiritually committing promiscuity. Remember, politically... King, priest, prophet, they were all together leading the nation. They were demanding this. They were demanding for the people to bring them their sin offering because they live off the people. Now, and it'll be like uh, uh, verse 9. And it'll be like people, like priests, so I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. And they will eat but not have enough, and they will play the harlot but not increase, because they have stooped, they have stopped, I'm sorry, they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. 
Now, this is a um, fascinating thing because as, as Christians, you know, this is our, this is the, what we need to focus on, right? This should be attractive to every believer. Holiness, holy living. Um, I'm not going to mention the other one, but what if I put a, something up there that would get everybody's attention, right? And the world is very attracted to, right? It's a three-letter word, and you guys know what it is. Everybody would go, oh, yeah. And that is the attraction that people had in that time, right? Is if you put up this big word out there, three letters, people would focus on because their lust and iniquity would go toward it. But as Christians, we are to be drawn to holiness. Pastors weren't teaching that. In fact, Peter would go on to say, if you study 2 Peter, that you can know a false prophet by one, many ways, but one of them is that they'll never preach a holiness that is higher than what they have achieved. You will never hear a false teacher say, you need to be holy in such a way that I'm striving for that holiness too. They'll always teach a holiness that they have already achieved themselves. Well, who cares? We need to have a holiness that we haven't achieved yet, that we strive for, that we seek after. So I love that book, right? The Pursuit of Holiness, right? And we need to teach in that way because I haven't achieved what I've been apprehended to do. Like Paul said, we haven't, we haven't got to that holiness yet. But if we stop to the level of comfort that we've gotten, you know, we, I'm, I'm comfortable where I am, then soon enough, you let our guard down and you become more and more le less holy, more lustful, more um, into iniquity because we're not striving for that holiness. Now, did anybody see that? Yeah. All right, good. I uh, just want to attract your attention. But for the sake of the audience, I just want to make sure. Now, let's continue. Verse 11, it changes now. It changes now. Both in the Hebrew and in the, in, the, in the English, you can kind of tell what it does. He's going to get into this poetic type of language. This is why Hosea is very interesting, because he's been talking to them, and now it changes into like a poem. It says, harlotry, wine, and new wine take away the understanding. What does that mean? It's like a proverb. And it's an interesting proverb because it's true. If you give people enough iniquity and enough harlotry and enough wine, they will have absolutely no understanding. Um, this is the condition of the people's hearts. You give them enough wine and enough <coughs> sexual activity, they won't understand. My people consult their wooden idols, he says. Now, this is what's happening in, in, uh, in Israel at the time. Now, this is a poem, but it's interesting. My people consult their, literally, their tree. It's the word tree. And their diviner's wand informs them. Literally, the word for stick. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, uh, my people consult trees. And their stick informs them. That's literally what it says. They consult trees, and the stick informs them. Uh, follow, it up, follow it up. For a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they have played the harlot, departing from their God. They offer sacrifices on the tops of mountains, burn incense on the hills, under the oak, under the poplar, under the terebinth tree, because their shade is pleasant. Because their shade is pleasant. Now, this is, again... Uh, tell Dan, it's in an area, a forestry area. This is, we know exactly where they went to worship the golden calf. Uh, this is Jeroboam's golden calf altar in Tel Dan, and uh, they, they worshiped the trees. In fact, we know that they did this because of the, the, the Canaanites had this idea that uh, oaks were really strong trees, which they are. So you know the area where um, um, uh, Abraham would have gone, Elon Moray, by Hebron. There's all these oaks, and it says, Abraham dwelt by the tree, oaks of uh, Mamre, which was very strong tree. So pagans would look at the oaks and go, what a wonderful God! Amazing strong tree, this must be a God. And they would worship it. And then to make the tree grow more or have more limbs or more trees, or more, so they would get into iniquity. 
and activities around the tree because it was a fertile, uh, like a like a um, fertility cult. And then a branch would fall off, and they would say, "Oh, the gods have given us something for us to cook with." or something for us to warm our house. And they would take the branch and they break it up and make it wood and they burn it. And they make the food and they warm up the house. And they say, well, isn't God so great? They gave us so much wonderful lumber. <laughs> well, all of us would say, how silly this is. It sounds like the current environmental movement. Yes, absolutely it is. This was the original tree huggers, all right? The idea did not come from Oregon, no offense to Oregonians, did not come from up north in Washington or California. It didn't come from them. It came from pagans, where they would look at Mother Nature and say, how wonderful it is. Isn't it great? They've given us these things. Now, Isaiah makes fun of it. We know the passage in Isaiah where it says, you know, people that worship idols, they, they, you know, they, they look at idols and they say, oh, is it great? You know, we chopped up our, our God and we burn up, a, we burn up our God to make the food. And they cook it up and they bow down and they worship from the same piece of wood. And they say, how silly this is. But that's what they did. And in fact, the whole family would go. And look what it says in verse, uh, at the end of verse 13. Therefore, your daughters play the harlot and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot or your brides when they commit adultery. Why? For the men themselves go apart with harlots and they offer sacrifices with temple prostitutes. So the people without understanding are ruined. So the whole family goes up to the tree and then the kid looks around and says, where's dad? I thought we all came here. Um, don't need to know where dad is. He's over there with um, some unscrupulous women on the other side of the tree, but you don't worry about that. You just stay here and worship the God. And if there was a girl, they would get, she would give up her body for the sake of the fertility cult and things like that. So the whole family was involved in this. And God says, I'm not going to punish the daughters. You say, Why? because they learned it from their parents. They learned it from the dad, <laughs> right? God's not saying, I'm not going to deal with it. He's saying, I'm just going to let them reap what they sow. Kind of like Romans 1, right? Where God doesn't necessarily intervene and judge that person, but allows their own sin to be their own judgment. Just like in homosexuality, just like in uh, sexual promiscuity, you get into these things where uh, you know, I've, I've had people that, uh, um, that I know people that uh, walked away from the Lord, came back, and they had AIDS. And they, and, and, they, and they would blame God. Why would God give me that? I said, brother, he did not give that to you. You went and went away from Christ and sowed this into your life, and now you're reaping it. Repent and believe. You may have to carry this for the rest of your life. You're going to be in the kingdom of God, but you're going to suffer the consequences of your sin. And this is what God's saying. I'm not going to punish them because they learned it from their parents. You know, they said a parent's hobby could be the kid's lifestyle. You ever heard that before? It's where you can just, I'm just going to, you know, it's just a little beer. It's just a little wine on the side here. It's just a hobby. And it might be perfectly okay. And you can handle it, tolerate it. But your kids may not. And that beer that you are so free to do, and that wine that you're so free to pass around, could be your kid's destruction. You just don't know. But the whole family's involved. And so this is a very important point to families and to parents, especially for dads. Do you know in the, in the, the Bible says, and we're just about done, so don't worry about the clock. We'll get it done. Um, every seventh year, everybody had a year off. How about that? Praise the Lord. All right. Every seventh year, you had a year off. I mean, who you worked six years, and on the seventh, you had a whole year off. Woo, that's my kind of work schedule. I would have had a couple of years off already in my job, right? And, um, but it wasn't to just go golfing and fishing and doing all these things, right? The parents were to go home, and after working six long years, they had a whole year to teach their kids the Word of God. That was their job as a dad. Their fathers were to teach the kids the Word of God for one year. Can you imagine a whole year off with your kids? Teaching them, instructing them. You, may not, you might want to go back to work. You know, but teaching them, instructing them, but that was your job now. You left six years, six years are done, seventh year, committed to your kids. Why? Because the kids, your kids are going to need it. 
And I can think of any other, any other time, like, like today, where parents, it's in, a, it, in God's deliberately showing us how important it is to teach our kids the Word of God. So they're going to need it probably in a greater effect and a greater capacity than we possibly can ever imagine that the times in which we live in, uh, they need it so bad. And so um, let's finish it off. From verse 15 to the end, we'll do it in five minutes. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, do not let Judah become guilty. And don't go to Gilgal, don't go to Beth Haven, and take the oath as the Lord lives. Since Israel stubborn, like a stubborn heifer, can the Lord now pasture them like a lamb in a large field? Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. The liquor is gone. They played the harlot continually. The rules dearly love, the rulers dearly love shame. What does that all mean? Don't go to Gilgal. Gilgal was a very special place in the spiritual conditions of Israel. This is where Joshua first entered the land and they set up a monument, sort of a, a milestone, uh, a remembering stone of what God did to them, uh, uh, through them, and brought them into the promised land. It was a beautiful spiritual landmark to remember. So if your kids ever say, what is the stones for? Oh, great question. Let me tell you, this is what God did. This, he brought us out of, the, out of the wilderness into the promised land. Now Gilgal, which is right on the border of Jericho, right, had become a spiritual harlot place. This is where they were committing harlotry. So God says, don't go to Gilgal. Don't go to Beth Aven. Beth Aven is the, uh, literally the house of wickedness or the house of idols. But this was a derogatory term for Bethel. Now, Bethel is a beautiful name, the house of God. Genesis 28, uh, Jacob had an encounter with God. You know, he had this, this dream, this vision, the, the, the ladder that goes up to heaven, which is Jesus. And he wakes up and he says, this is God. This is God's place here. This is the face of God. I, I've seen God. This is it. I'm going to build an altar to God. Bethel, the house of God, becomes a house of wickedness. This is where they worship the golden calf now. And it's a, it's a calling to Israel. Don't let Judah fall into this. You're going to do it, but don't let Judah do it. Unfortunately, Judah did it. Unfortunately, they went the same way. Israel's stubborn like a heifer. And you see the heifer is stubborn. You can't make him pull. You can't make him do anything. Uh, and they resemble the gods that they worshipped. Ephraim is joined to idols. Literally, they have become... Um, the word is like enamored with the idol, like they become one and uh, um, like if they've been um, uh, mesmerized by this idol and they become one with them. It's, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, their liquor is gone and they continue to play the harlot. That means that no matter what they do, even when the money's gone, even when the liquor's gone, they go into right into immorality. Um, final verse, the wind wraps them in its wings and they've all be ashamed because of their sacrifice. The wind wraps them in its wings, and they'll be ashamed. Well, Assyria was coming. Hosea was warning them. If you don't repent, God's going to bring the Assyrians. It says in Hosea, the Assyrians is like a bird of prey coming at you. Have you ever seen one of these vultures or these eagles? His wingspan are amazing. I mean, I've seen an eagle really close, and <coughs> amazing birds, but it's a, it's, a, it's a bird of prey. It's going to come. It's a predator. It, they're they're going to come, and it's like a Syria. It's going to come, and you have no hope but to trust in God. But you don't listen to God, and therefore that wind is going to come. This contrary wind is going to come, and you're be, going to be ashamed because of your sacrifice, because of your idolatry. <coughs> Later on, next chapter, we're going to talk about the idolatry of power. The idolatry of power. They thought, okay, yeah, we might not be in a good situation, but we're going to make deals with uh, Assyria, Egypt, and they're going to get us out of this mess, and we're going to be fine. Again, idolatry. We have idolatry in our nation. We have idolatry in the church. We worship everything and anything but Jesus. Uh, we worship technology. We worship all kinds of things. This is the people of God. Anything can become an idol if it takes your affections away from God, away from Jesus. And you say, well, Pastor, I can't imagine the New Testament telling us all this. Well, remember the 1 John? 
it ends in such a powerful way. First John says, it's not there yet, eventually will come. There it is. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's, that's one of the last books in the New Testament. Now think about that. It's not just an Old Testament commandment. It's a New Testament application. Why? Because we can get to the point where we can worship and elevate anything besides Jesus. And to the point where these idols can take us away from God and can put us in a situation where we're actually worshiping the blessings of God, the good things of God, instead of the Lord himself. That's the, the giver of life, except the, the, uh, anything but the giver. We can worship gifts in churches. We can worship our intellect. We can worship all kinds of things. We can worship our statements of faith. We can worship our theology. We can worship our framework. We, should, we can worship all kinds of things. And it becomes like an idol that you dare not knock. We can worship a pastor. We can worship a movement. We can worship uh, whatever. And it becomes an idolatry. And God says, get rid of the idols. Get rid of the idols. Remember, even Moses had the Nehushtan. You know, the, the bronze serpent, great symbol of Jesus. It was the symbol of Christ, John 3. By the time you got to the kings, they were worshiping the, the, the bronze serpent. Wait a minute, that was a great move of God when he delivered you from the poisonous snake. Now you're worshiping it? Because that is in the heart of man. So First John, one of the most practical Christian books, says, don't worship idols. Learn from Israel. The failure of leadership where pastors and teachers do not tell their congregation what, how you can know God. Not know God here, but know God here and here and lived out. And many times that's part of discipleship. But we have divorced the idea from that a Christian could be a disciple and that some Christians are not disciples. We've divorced the, the ideas that some Christians are disciples, some Christians are not disciples. So don't make them disciples. Discipleship and, and being a Christian, they've divorced this idea. Like there's two parallel lines now. You can be a Christian or you can be a disciple. Which one do you want to be? Well, it takes a lot of time, a lot of work to be a disciple. I'm just going to stay a Christian, but I'm okay. God's word says no. Discipleship, Christianity, Christian, it, it's, an, it, it's the same term. We're all called unto discipleship. <clears throat> And when you don't know, because you're not told, God says, I'm going to deal with those priests. But you know what? Unfortunately, because of the lack of knowledge, people are destroyed. That's what Hosea says. Keep yourself from idol. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. May your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Bless our time together, Lord. Not because we deserve it, but because you're so great and you're so merciful. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. Help us to know you, not in an intellectual, assent, statement of faith sort of way, but in a real, loving, passionate, practical, activity way that we can put into practice that what you taught us. Empower us, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. In his name, the Lord Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.